Adventist Stewardship Ministries presents The Journey from Crisis to Life. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, dear young people, I welcome you back in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. In response to the turmoil and turbulences happening around us today, the theme of our stewardship and phases series is the journey from crisis to life. Throughout these presentations, we are revisiting one known story of the Bible and discover and rediscover that the Bible is a light unto our feet, a lamp on our path, even for such a time. The Bible tells the story of a widow and her two young boys whose future was severely threatened. The father who had died recently had contracted a huge debt that he could not repay before dying. The mother could not pay it back neither. The creditors came and demanded payment and decided to take the two boys as slaves if they did not receive payment, their money, at a set time. However, this story that we are exploring together with all the adverse circumstances has a happy ending. And it is not a script for a movie for Hollywood, Nollywood, or Bollywood. It comes from the true word of God. This is the reason for the title of our series, The Journey from Crisis to Life. We are learning during this series how no through situations can be transformed into abundance. In our third presentation, we, thir we shared about another principle of the journey from crisis to life. Use your opportunities. Dangers and threats are everywhere, but there are also great opportunities that are available. The greatest opportunity of all for believer is the constant presence and actions of God in the midst of crisis, use your opportunities. Today, we are learning about another principle. Apply the rule of success. The journey from crisis to life is not a virtual one or only a mental exercise. It has a practical component. Let us pray before we proceed. Lord Father, we are thankful for all the opportunities that you have and you are providing for your children. Thank you, Lord, for being present. Thank you, Lord, for being active in the midst of the crises of life. At this time, we want to learn more from you. Send us your Holy Spirit and teach us, Lord, the way of life and salvation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. After the widow had acknowledged that she had some little oil, a flask of anointed oil, and reminded that her neighbors had got jars that they were ready and willing to give or share, the prophet gave her an interesting order. This command is our focus in this presentation. We read in verse 3 and 4, in verses 3 and 4, Elisha said, Go around and ask your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons pour out into all the jars 
and as each is filled, put it to one side. Go around, ask, go inside, shut door, pour oil, fill, put to one side. These two verses are full of action verbs, things to do. When considering this order, we quickly understand that it required some efforts from the widow to go and knock on the neighbor's doors and to ask for and transport all these jars could be quite tiresome. When I was a little boy, I was so shy that when my mother would send me for some errands to a neighbor's house, I would prefer to give my pocket money to my little sister for her to go in my place instead of me going. In our story, it seems that the woman went by herself. Do you realize that nothing had prevented the prophet from flying the jars from the neighbor's houses to the house of the widow? This is something possible for a prophet of God. But this he, he did not do. He listed the actions and the woman had to accomplish them. The intervention of God on our behalf does not exclude our own involvement. There is no substitute for effort and hard work. The Bible is clear about the law of success. We can first read about the law of success from the book of Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. There is a causal relationship between diligence in actions and creating wealth. This passage is a plea for believers, you and I, to develop a work ethic. We can also read in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. We have rightly applied this text to encourage generosity. But it is also an invitation to be generous in our actions and efforts. The law of success and reward is valid for those who know God and for those who do not know God. Let us listen to these words of Ellen White. The hill of progress is not to be climbed without effort. No one need expect to be carried along to the prize, either in religious or secular matters, independently of his own exertions. The race is not for the swift, fortunately, nor the battle for the strong. Yet he that dealeth with a slack hand will become poor. The persevering and industrious are not only happy themselves, but they contribute largely to the happiness of others. Competency and comfort are not ordinarily attained except at the price of earnest industry. These words clearly state to us that faith and prayers cannot compensate for lack of committed labor. We admire the athlete who has established a new record. We praise the researcher when he made a breakthrough discovery. We celebrate the student who had an outstanding achievement. We clap for the musician's thrilling performance. They have something in common, a commitment to hard and persevering work. This is a compulsory path for the journey from crisis to life, the law of success. As I was growing up as a little boy, I attended a Christian primary school. 
I observed a strange practice among my little friends that has helped me to understand the absurdity of separating prayer from diligence in work. Each time that we had to write an exam, my friends will go, would go to the church that was on the school compound and would come back with their pens or pencils dripping with water. I could not understand. I could not understand the meaning of the wet pen. Then one day, one of my good friends told me the secret. We go to church to dip our pens in blessed water. Therefore, when we have to write the test, our pen just flows on the paper. I could not refrain, refrain from smiling even today when I think of that. No review or study and your pen flows on the paper. How can this be true? When I grew up, I observed an Adventist version of the wet pen. The week before the kids have to write exams, the pastor will call all of them to the pulpit for a very special prayer. You know what I'm talking about. But do you know who would rush to the pulpit? Who would come the nearest to the pastor, even wanting him or her to touch their forehead? Many times, those who have not worked diligently during the whole year. The truth is, prayer, even pastoral prayers, cannot replace steady work apply the rule of success. One of my Bible heroes is Nehemiah. He is not as well known as David, Moses, Joshua, or Peter. He was not a king, not a prophet, not a military leader, but just a cup bearer for Artaxerxes, a foreign king. However, Nehemiah teaches me about the meaning of diligence in service and work. The first section of the book that bears his name reveals some key characteristic of a diligent person. A diligent person is one who is concerned about the reality of others. When Nehemiah received the report about the condition of, of the people of Jerusalem and of the walls of the cities, he was affected and he cried bitterly. There is no place for indifference and coldness to what others are going through. A diligent worker is one who prays. We read in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4, second part, For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He ran first to God to seek for a solution, even when the problem was economic, military, political, and infrastructural. He prayed earnestly and fasted. The diligent worker is one who commits his own person. In response to the situation in Jerusalem, Nehemiah did not provide only some good advices or sent a huge donation, but he left the comfort of the palace to be part of the solution. This is the request he made to King Artaxerxes, his master. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 5. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild it. I can rebuild it. The diligent worker is one who assesses reality 
and plans for change. After arriving in Jerusalem, Nehemiah posed and made an assessment of the condition of the wall and of the extent of the work ahead. Then, only then, he planned with the others what they should do. Rushing and acting without thinking are not synonymous with diligence. The diligent worker is one who teams up with others. Nehemiah sought the partnership of all those in Jerusalem to restore the wall of the city. Diligence does not turn one into a superhero. The diligent worker is one who perseveres in the midst of challenges. Nehemiah had to face opposition. He'll hear the description that he himself made of the situation. We read in Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 8. They all, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. It was perilous and violent opposition. But he kept pushing until he accomplished his assignment. The diligent worker is one with an unselfish spirit. Nehemiah did not use his position as the king's envoy to take advantage of others or to abuse those who were weak and vulnerable. This is how he decided to treat others. Chapter 5 verses 18 I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on these people. As a result of Nehemiah's diligence in work, we read in Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 15, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. It was a miracle. A miracle made possible through God's intervention and the diligence of Nehemiah. As the widow was moving around and collecting the jars, she was activating the rule of success, diligence in one's action. Are we following the rule of success? Remember, friends, there is no shortcut to great results even for the Christians. But as a believer, we still have an advantage. We can depend on God's power when the path is hard and tough. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength, words of Paul. When Joshua, as the new leader, of the death of Moses had to introduce the Israelites into the promised land. You know what I'm talking about. There is this interplay between human's diligence and God's power. We read in Joshua chapter 1 verse 5 about God's commitment. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life as it was with Moses. So I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. The true word of God. The land is inhabited by giants. The cities are surrounded with thick and tall walls. I will be with you. In the next verse, God mentions about Joshua's responsibility. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land. God's presence does not remove the sense of commitment, responsibility, and diligence from Joshua. Today, if you would like to claim the promise of divine strength for your activities, and claim the power you need to fulfill diligently your multiple assignments as a housewife, a student, a professional, and as a witness for Christ. 
You want to be strong and courageous in your duties and responsibilities for such a difficult time. Join me as I pray for you. Thank you for reminding us that the journey from crisis to life is for those who are strong and courageous, for those who apply themselves to accomplish diligently the tasks, the duties, and responsibilities that you have given to each one of us. Lord, you know our limitations. You know our frailties and weaknesses. But we want to be good and faithful servants. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Empower us, Lord. Give us the strength to move forward even when the wind is contrary. Even when it is hard to advance, you are calling us to be courageous. And by your grace, we want to be strong and courageous. Thank you for listening to our prayer and help us to apply the law of success. We are praying in the name of Jesus. Amen. Dear friends, we are ending here our fourth presentation. In our next presentation, we are discovering another great principle of the journey from crisis to life. Believe in God's good plan for your life. In the meantime, please send us your comments, your prayer requests, and we send you God's blessings.